Hello, I'm Donald Leggett. Welcome to the latest London Southeast interview. I'm joined today by George Bennett, CEO at Rainbow Rare Earths, a producer of Rare Earth Metals. Welcome, George. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today from South Africa. I believe you're, you're talking to us from Johannesburg, home of, home of the miners in Africa. That is correct. Um, a large part of the mining industry developed here. Very good. And for those of us who are less familiar with Rainbow Rare Earths, why don't we start by asking you to summarize the, the Rainbow business? So Rainbow are a um, listed um, mining company um, on the London Stock Exchange, and we are currently mining rare earth minerals in Burundi and Africa. It's the only uh, one of the only three listed rare earth mines outside of China. And we're producing um, rare earth concentrate from our trial mining operations in Burundi. And we've recently made an acquisition of uh, another rare earth um, project in South Africa. I understand you've been, you've been running the business since September last year. What will you do differently? Um, when I took over the business last year, um, I, uh, I realized that the previous management team had approached the, uh, the Kakara project in a slightly different manner to, to what I would. Um, I've got a fair amount of experience in mining. I, um, I listed a, a mining exploration business called Chanter Gold in London in 2004, which has successfully um, produced two gold mining uh, gold mines. And I also started and successfully listed MDM Engineering in London in 2008. And MDM uh, designed and built 22 uh, mines all over Africa. And so I have a fair, about, fair amount of experience in exploration as well as uh, building mines in Africa. And I realized that the Kokora project hadn't gone through the initial stages of, of full-scale exploration and feasibility study. So is that what you plan to do with Gakara now? Take it through, it's a trial mine currently. And Correct. You, you, so you, what Gakara did correctly was that um, we've proved the route to the market. In other words, we have an offtake agreement with Tiss and Krip. We, our trial mining concentrate, which is one of the highest in the world, grading at 54% TREO, which means total rare earth oxides. We're shipping um, via a contract with Tiss and Krip to China. We're selling it and we're producing a consistent high-grade rare earth uh, concentrate. And very importantly, in our concentrate, we've got about 20% neodymium presidinium, which are two of the key rare earth elements uh, which are required for the green technology that we'll talk about later. And these two metals make up 85% of the value of the rare earth basket. But part of the problem, uh, Gokara, previously was consistency in terms of the ore supply. So uh, what will you do to sort that out? So what I've done is that, as I said, I approached this slightly differently. We, um, we were using mechanical sort of equipment to, to remove overburden and expose high-grade earth veins, which were actually extracted by hand. I've, I've gone to a more formalized conventional mining method using mechanical equipment to, to strip the ore out and then to mine the ore mechanically and improve the tonnage going down to the concentrate, the pilot plant, that we have, and, uh, and as I said, wherever we mine in our license area, we consistently get the same high-grade concentrate with the same value of, of nedonium and presidinium in our rare earth basket. This is very important because it's proving that we have a, a, a large mineralized area, I believe, which comes from a, a single source, and we've been going along traditional exploration lines by getting an initial exploration target, which is known as a jork target. And with that, we will then be doing further drilling and proving that this is a large scale mineralized area in Burundi. Okay, let's turn to uh, the, the business itself. You initially recapitalized RBW with the equity and loans. Now you've raised, raised 2.56 million in a share placing. So how important has it been to put the business on a firm financial footing? This recent placing has been very important. It allows us to to do the work I want to do at Kokara, which is to um, supplement the new mechanical equipment that I have purchased and uh, and get Kokara to break even in small cash flow positive situation in country. And at the same time, it'll allow me to drill the Palabora asset that we've acquired and take it to an inferred and possibly measured and, and uh, well, M&I as it's known in the mining industry. Uh, that category of, of jork, um, of Jork, um, Jork Resource will allow us then to take this project into a full feasibility mode. 
Okay. The new project, uh, as you mentioned, is Falaborwa in South Africa. Has production there begun? And, and in what ways is it different from uh, Gekara in Burundi? So is, it, is it diversification or is it more of the same, basically? No, well, uh, Palabora is a very unique asset that we've secured. It's, uh, it's not in production. It's two gypsum stacks. And these gypsum stacks are the result of, of 50, 60 years of, um, of phosphate rock mining by the government uh, mining company called Fosco in South Africa in an area called Palabora, which is a very, very well-established mining town. And with this phosphate rock, it was, um, it was put through a flotation process and concentrated and then sent next door to a company called Sassel, which is a major chemical conglomerate here in South Africa. It's actually, it's a global conglomerate. And Sassel uses this concentrated uh, um, phosphate to produce phosphoric acid. And in that phosphoric acid process, rare earths were concentrated within, within this process and it was then deposited in a gypsum residue. And this gypsum residue was then deposited on two gypsum stacks at Pelleboa. These gypsum stacks are believed to have some 35 million tons of gypsum on them. And the initial grades indicate that they are grading at 0.6 TREO, which is total rare earth oxides. Now, 0.6 might seem quite a low grade, but when you, can, when you compare these gypsum stacks to a typical, what they call ironic clay um, rare earth project in China, and ironic clays are very similar from a mining point of view that they're very cheap to mine. They just mud, which you wash into a concentrate process plant and these gypsum stacks will, will go through a similar process. It's, it, it's all sitting above the ground. And basically those ironic clay deposits in China grade 0.03 to 0.08%. So these gypsum stacks, the initial indications are they about 10 times higher grade. And very importantly, they sit in chemical form on these, um, on these gypsum stacks. So a large part of the process that a normal real project has to go through has already taken place. Very importantly for Palabora is that they built a pilot plant and they produced three tons of rare earth carbonate, which was sold. And this proved to me that the gypsum stacks um, can be processed and the rare earths can be extracted from these stacks. The fact that they built a comprehensive pilot plant and ran it successfully. Great, but it's important to say that it's, it's, these, this is a chem chemical process and not a, not a mining process. Correct, uh, this will be a chemical process and it will be on the site of the old um, Sassel phosphoric acid plant, which has been mothballed. And basically, we have a huge amount of in infrastructure that comes with these two gypsum stacks. From the point of view of offices, two rail sidings that are operating every day within uh, the site. We've got high voltage um, switch yard just uh, directly next door to the one stack. We have uh, workshops, machine shops, and within the Pelleboa town itself, we have a highly skilled labor force with machine shops, uh, equipment suppliers, and so forth to support uh, the project. So it's not like a project that you find somewhere in the middle of Africa where you've got to build all this infrastructure. It's sitting on our doorstep. It's all there. It even comes with an airport five minutes away. Oh, happy days. Uh, are you prioritizing capital spending on Falaborwa over Gakora in the short term, or is it 50-50? In the short term, we're allocating uh, the, the capital fairly evenly. We are progressing Kakara, as I said, with a bit of new equipment, some modifications to the pilot plant to keep proving that we can consistently produce this high-grade concentrate in our pilot plant while we do the mining to, to develop our resource so we can go into full-scale commercial production. At the same time, we'll be moving the Palabora project um, through resource drilling, which has started already, I might add, and into the various resource categories so we can go into a full feasibility uh, study next year. And what's your production target for Gakora in 2021? So at Gakara, we hope to achieve between 1,200 and 1,500 tons of concentrate production for 2021. And how does that reflect on the years before? It'll be the best production we've achieved um, in the prior three years. Fantastic. Um, Oh, we've, we've, we've touched on that. Uh, when do you expect, when do you, make, well, Gakara, is, I, I think you may have said, was, is quite close to break even. Is that correct? Yes, correct. We, we expect to break even in the first quarter of next year and continue there on. And how many years before uh, uh, Falaborwa uh, breaks even? Well, Palabora will, um, I believe, uh, will be a fantastic project and we're going to go straight into, we'll, we'll, um, we'll do some pilot plant trials again 
but we'll go straight into uh, full-scale commercial production. I'm targeting within two to two and a half years, and uh, we believe the project will be very low ca capital intensity as a result of the previous um, uh, chemical process that the gypsum now sits in, and also because of the infrastructure that we have around there, and we'll have very low OPEX as well for the Pelabora project, making it a very exciting project. We hope between the two projects, Kakara and Pelabora, will be one of the big largest producers of neodymium and praseodymium in the world outside of China. Which takes us to my final question. Why should retail shareholders buy the rainbow stock? Why, why you, why now? Well, if you look at the forecast demand for neodymium and praseodymium um, over the next 10 years, that's been in, in green technology with wind turbines and the wind power, electric vehicles, which we all know are set to grow exponentially. Every drone, every electric scooter needs rare earth magnets. And, um, and basically these rare earth metals are key for the green technology. And uh, the, the forecast demand for neodymium and praseodymium is expected to go up fivefold in the next five to 10 years. George Bennett, I've learned an awful lot about Rainbow today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's well, I'd very... just like to add in the last month, neodymium and praseodymium prices have gone up between 25 and 40%. So it's an indication that the inflection point in demand is starting to happen in, in uh, 2021 and 2022. So you think you're in a, a rare earth sweet spot at the moment, George? I do think we are, correct. Fantastic. Thank you so much for interjecting and uh, uh, telling us that. Very useful. Thank you very much for speaking to us today, George Bennett, uh, speaking to us from Johannesburg. It's good to get an operational update from you. Uh, please do follow London Southeast on Twitter if you like this interview. That's at London Southeast and at Donald Leggett for me. Thank you for watching and stay safe.